Hello, everybody, and welcome to Mitchell Gates Fine Arts. Thank you all for being here tonight for supporting the gallery, the arts in general, and especially artist, curator, scholar, and <coughs> author Tom Bells. Tom shares with us a gorgeous personal vision as he explores light and shadow around his home using a relatively simple, cameraless process of transferring image to paper, resulting in unique cyanotype photos. As author, he has written about the history of photography and also about life on a commune. Further, his cyanotypes are currently on exhibit at the Atlas Gallery in London, England, and three large drawings may be seen at the Brownburn Museum and Art Center in its North Northwest exhibition. For art lovers, there's a joy which comes in recognizing an individual view elevate to a grander moment. Tom's cyanotypes take us to that special place. So please enjoy the artwork, and please help me welcome artist Tom Phelps. Very nice. Well, so I guess I have to live up to that. Um, can you hear okay? I, acoustics feel a little more like a matador than anything else. But um, so I'll try to tell you a bit about. This, these two disparate kinds of art that are, that are on view here. Uh, first, I thought I'd just give you my bona fides, which is that I grew up in Bennington and went to Putney and knew lots of people in the communal scene. So I've been going through Brattleboro for more than 50 years and more recently uh, did some work with the museum. So I got to know um, Petey and Jim even, even before the gallery and got to watch the gallery kind of take shape. Um, so it was a great place for, for me to show. So what are these, where do they come from, and so on? Um, this, this part of the show is kind of a story, and so I'll tell you the story, and uh, that is that behind our house there's a tree, and, and on sunny days there's a shadow, um, and that's what this photograph is. Um, for years I, I, uh, I was trying to figure out what to do with this. I, I, my wife and I, Jennifer, who's here, we were both very moved by it. It actually goes on in another few feet. It's a beautiful thing. And um, I, I had two methods of approach. You know, one was um, historical, which is that I was a curator and had done a lot with the history of photography. And I, I just kind of saw it as, um, uh, as something that, that should be registered in, in some way. And the other part of it was that I had always drawn and um, enjoyed drawing. And I, these drawings here are my attempts to actually draw this phenomenon. Uh, they're nice drawings, but they, they don't move me in any, any real way. And so uh, that's the artistic side of it. And I came back to the historical curatorial side, which was that I knew about cyanotypes. And I thought, well, maybe in photography I could capture this. That is to say, this is a photograph of it. But it, it didn't quite you know, have the depth that, that I wanted. And I found that you could get large cyanotype paper, which I had never heard about. So um, that turned to drawings. And then the drawings kind of turned into these. This is what came immediately from that right there. Also this one and also the one behind you there on the, on the single wall. Um, so what I liked about cyanotypes, um, first a little bit of history. Maybe you guys know this, but so cyanotypes are a very early process, starting around just a year or two after the invention of photography. And this is Anna Atkins, the person who's best known for doing these 
who illustrated her um, father's botanical explorations with these. These are about life size. So these are small and they're still, they're, they're stuff put on, on photosensitive paper. Um, so I knew about it as an early process and I like the simplicity of it. And I will show you, for those who don't know, how that works, which is roughly like this. I happen to have a handy palm leaf. <laughs> So if you assume that that's the sun um, and you, you put a leaf on there for um, depending on the time of year, but in the summer just a minute or two, in the winter a lot longer, um, if at all. So you would, you would get a negative there and you just roll it up so that it doesn't get any more light. Um, and for the process that I use with this paper, you just wash it with water. So I can do this all outdoors in the summertime. Um, and the tree was right there. So I developed a body of work. These one, two, three, these four are, are from that um, era about five years ago. Um, and I found that these transcriptions, basically, of, of nature were kind of what I was looking for. Um, although, as I'll explain, they weren't exactly what I was looking for. Uh, um, one of the things that I liked about this process was that there were a lot of surprises to it. And I would look at this, this set of shadows here and I'd say, oh, okay, um, but you put up some paper there, that was not enough light. You do various things. Um, what you had to do, it turned out, was to get up into the tree. And <laughs> so um, the way these work is that what's white gets no light and what's dark gets the most light. And if it isn't really touching, you, you don't get white. And that's OK. It's just a little different. So I was looking for various um, amounts of contrast. So here you have, you have a lot of contrast. And here you have a little less. And these two, for example, were these are contiguous parts of the same tree. And I was trying to get a, a bigger piece. And as you'll see in a second, you can get even bigger. But um, I found that it really did capture what I was trying to do. So that, that kind of brings you to that, that point of what I was doing. Um, and I'll, I'll get to these drawings later. We'll start with the cyanotypes. So having gotten that far, one thing you'll notice is these are quite small leaves. That's just the way that tree is. Um, and what I got wasn't quite you know, what I was thinking. I mean, this is a photograph, this is a cyanotype. They're, they're really quite different. And that was part of the fun, um, to find basically kind of a path of discovery. And uh, even in the case where I knew, what, got to know what I was doing, each print became, you know, you don't really quite know what you're going to get. And so what you develop is a sense of looking for shadows, looking for uh, a flat kind of leaf that will um, that will register in the way that you want. And so I thought, well, if I can do this with small leaves, what would it look like with large leaves? And, and that's how you get these over here, which was the next series that I did. These are catalpa leaves. And as I said, it's all one to one. You know? These are small leaves. Those are large leaves. So what's white is touching the leaves of, of this tree near my house. And again, this is going around the tree to try to get three three you know, images in a row, um, I managed to do, I think there are five or seven series like that. But I discovered this year when I came back that the town had, had pruned the tree. <laughs> and so that's, that's probably the last of, of this series is the ones that I've done. And then later this year, my house painter pruned this tree. <laughs> so, so what do you do? Well, if you look at the back of the room, um, this fall, after I'd traveled a little bit, um, I realized when I came home that it was fall and there wasn't as much sunlight and there were a lot fewer leaves. So what I did was I started collecting leaves and instead of doing these prints up, you know, like this, trying to get this, uh, I would scatter leaves, you know, on, on these on my porch, which got just enough sunlight to be able to do this. So these are each one of a series of six. Each one is one of a series of six. And the idea is that they're different than these, which have a kind of 
soulful feel and they're, they're more decorative and the idea is that you can show them in different ways and arrange them in groups. Um, this is three different ones, but if you took three or four or six of the same, you might have a kind of an interesting mm. pattern there. So there's really three types of work here. This is one, that's the second, and that's the third in terms of uh, cyanotypes. Um, I also learned a lot about light and how it differs, you know, at different times of year and in different places. And I would see something and I'd say, oh, that's great. Um, I have to get that, you know, but I need to do this other thing. Well, half an hour later, you know, it was basically gone. And so you had to, you had to realize these, these patterns about how to capture the stuff, which I, I pretty much have down now. Um, but that's, that's pretty much the story of those. Now, I did learn two things, that, or at least two things, that I think were really interesting. One was that you don't get what you see, which is what I was trying to explain here. You, you get something different, and that's okay. Uh, you you kind of roll with that. Um, another thing was that, um, uh, well, there's the surprise element. What was I, I wanted to mention this. Um, hmm, all right, I'll, I'll come back to it, but it's, uh, there were a couple, oh yes, I know what it is. I expected my cyanotypes to be like, like Anna Atkins, you know, who had done them in one place and nothing moved. But actually it turned out immediately that you get movement. And the movement turned out to be a whole element that really gives them character that I, I hadn't expected. And so I had to go in that direction. There was no way I was going to get these pristine single images, which is fine, but it isn't what was possible for me. And so I ended up with a lot of movement. Now the ones in the back are a little different because they're sitting down there and not moving. And so if I want to create different darknesses or movement, I have to do it by hand. So they're, they're really kind of a different animal in a sense. Um, but that, that basically is the, the cyanotype part of this. Now I said I kept notebooks and I do, I do draw a lot. I don't even take a camera anymore when I travel. I, I take a sketchbook because it makes you look and you, you have to concentrate and, um, and uh, take in what you're seeing and translate it into something. And I, I realized that I had this style of lines. They show up here and they, they definitely show up in these drawings and they show up in the drawings at the museum right now, which are quite different. Um, I went on a trip and it was a kind of a crisis moment. I didn't have anything to do. I was sitting in this, this hotel room and I, I brought a notebook and I said, okay, I'm going to just start with a few lines and I'm going to see where this goes. So I opened this little notebook and I just, I made a couple of lines and my, my uh, message to myself, which was similar to the cyanotypes, was each time I make one, I'm going to look at it and I'm, I'm going to try to learn something from it as opposed to just turning them out, you know, in a production kind of way. So I looked at these lines and um, I tried to learn something. I made some other lines, you know, do them this way, do them this way. Well, by the end of, of this little vacation, um, a day or two, really, when I had 100, 100 and some pages of drawings, I had developed this style that I really liked, and, and this is what this is. It's a kind of meditative, um, quiet way of spending your time with, with lines. Uh, to organize them, I make them into shapes. But actually, they're, about, they're more about the activity of how hard you press and where you stop and the difference. You know, you try to make the lines all the same distance, but they're not quite the same distance. And so you can see them from across the room. You can see a shape, but you can also come up close and, and find all this internal activity that, that interests me. And I think you can see that in this one, for example, both of these really. But there's a kind of a light spot that runs down there. And that's because when you start to make a line, you, you press, but then you kind of automatically let up. And you know, your, your muscles do all these things that you wouldn't really know unless you recorded it in some way. And the same with, with this. Um, there's a bit of line there, and then various little breaks and kind of differences in the, in the thickness. And that's kind of where I was, I was going with that. You can't probably see it, but in this one, I tried a little more control. It's a diamond. It goes from dark to light, you know. So there was, I was trying to control it rather than just see what happened. And then in something like this, 
um, I tried to scale up by using wider uh, graphite crayons. And instead of scaling up, I realized that the wider it is, the lighter it is. You know, you, you get a, a very fine point, you get a very dark line, you get a wide thing that you try to press, you get, you get a lighter line. And so I was experimenting with different thicknesses. So it's thick and light, uh, pointed and dark, and, and it turned out that it kind of looked like water. And, and it's very interesting that a lot of people, this reminds them of water. So there are some similarities, even though they, they weren't really intended. But that's, that's kind of the origin of, of these. And then they went on. I, I did try to scale up. There are some larger ones here, triangles. Pentagons, and I think there are parallelograms around the corner. Uh, these are attempts to get bigger. And another use that I made of it was wall drawings. And um, I use something that's, uh, I take a, a design of some kind, I, I make it larger the way painters do. Uh, and I, uh, on a wall, use all parallel lines to fill it in. It becomes uh, almost like a shadow, almost like, like one of these, but in black and white. And that's something I've, I've only done a couple of times, but I, I really enjoy doing usually something floral or natural, but it, it could be anything. Um, and there the issue is the length of the lines, and you, you, know, you want to keep them parallel, you want to keep them even, but they, they do have that kind of agitation in them that, that makes them interesting. So um, that's, that's kind of wh where I'm at with these particular bodies of work. Um, I find it very satisfying, I mean, so much so that I turn my garage into a studio and I have <laughs> more room to work than I used to and I can be much more productive. But um, these are, all of these are over the last five years or so and uh, the drawings are just the last year or two, I'd say. Um, it's very, uh, it's very satisfying and it's really nice to see them up here and, and have people be able to appreciate them. Because as artists know, you never really see them. They're all stacked somewhere or in a drawer or something. <laughs> so it's, it's very nice to actually uh, see them. Um, so um, that's sort of the, the quick version of this. And if people have questions, that's fine. Or I can, I'm sure, uh, be induced to go on at great length. <laughs> people have any questions about any of this? People who've done cyanotypes or, or drawing? Yeah. Well, I, I did them once a long time ago, but I can't, I can't remember what you said about the darks and the light. And I'm just curious, uh, the one in the middle, that there's, oh, it's, it seems to be pure white. Like, right. how did that happen? Right. Again? And tell me about the light thing. Well, those are interesting because all three of them were done by the same method, and that is putting these things down on, on this thing. Um, so with the ones in the middle, these were very large leaves. Those were leaves actually that I collected in Paris on the day of the recent events, mm -hmm. which was pretty amazing. And I, uh, I saw these leaves and I thought, well, this will be a way of remembering this. And I brought them home and I, I made this print. The whitest ones are down the longest. And the light bluish ones are on less, you know, going. So it goes, the white is on there, let's say, in this case, because the sun was very low, it was the fall. I think these might have taken as much as 10, 15, 20 minutes. So those would have been on, let's say, 10 minutes long, and then the others only five, only one or two. And so you get the ones that are on the longest are white, very white in that case, because the leaves are so big. And then there's a medium tone in there, like on the right center, and then there's a, a darker, and the darker they are, the less long they have been on. That's, so I, it's a different kind of game to do that than to catch something in nature. Um, and they do have that look, I think. They have a kind of a design look rather than a, a nature look. Yeah? So when you're doing these larger pieces, uh, so, uh, the, the ones that, with the trees and the arbor, obviously you're, you're holding them up. And <laughs> yeah. so uh, how much of a, a uh, preconceived idea do mm. you have, or is it just? I mean, I'm finding I'm doing some um, saying attention now, and I, I just love it. It seems very freeing, like very intuitive that you just sort of 
you're just kind of like attempting something and then and then you get something and then you kind of build from oh this is what it is and then build from there yes. and i'm just wondering like how when you start what do you, what's your idea like, yeah that's that's the process um well, I started trying to capture this shadow, you know, yeah. that was the beginning. And then I got to see what you could actually get. And after that, I was much more aware of um, where particular sets of leaves were mm -hmm. and so on. And, and I would, uh, actually I was trying to get repeatable, relatively repeatable things because if you're an artist and you do these things, often it's hard to part with them. And I thought, well, if I make, yeah. if I make 10 that are very similar, yeah. Uh, so I would go back to these places and try to, um, I knew it wasn't going to be exactly the same, but you could get pretty much that. Yeah. And then I would move on to something a little, this is a different part of the same tree. Yeah. You know, I, I'd say, okay, I know what that little circle is all about, and I would go back to that. And it really set me on a course of, you know, I can't walk anywhere now without looking at all oh. the sh this. <laughs> That's what I think, too. Like everything looks like a possible yeah. sayanity. Right, but the, the other thing is you, you look at the, the things and you see whether they would really work or not. Yeah. And if you, if you have a lot of flat leaves, like these catalpas, it works. If you look at, um, well, I tried uh, hedges, for example. Hedges are quite interesting because oh, yeah. you get hundreds of tiny little things. Yeah. But if you don't press the paper up against it, you don't get much of anything. And so you, I go back to my hedge, you know, I, people probably wonder what yeah. I'm doing <laughs> in their hedge. But um, uh, that's my hedge yeah. and, and, you know, it has to be 10.30 in the morning because that's the only time that yeah. there's all of these things. Yeah, um, I find it very exploratory and yeah. kind of adventurous in a nice way. Well, it must be really interesting to see 10 of one, you know, you're saying you're doing I would love to see those ten together because there'd be so much change. Well, the first, time. the first time I showed these, um, it was this this series here um, at the Bennington Museum a couple of years ago. The wall that they had available, I showed six together. Yeah. But they were six each different enough that it didn't look repetitious, and it, it just looked stunning. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was really mm -hmm. amazing, and. I think that's a real possibility. The downside is this blue is very intense and yeah. there's only so much you can show, which I was, I was saying to Jim and Petey, you know, you don't want to fill your whole gallery with these. You want to break it up somewhat because it's kind of overpowering. But given the place, um, I can definitely see with these panels that I use, stacking, doing different things to show that kind of extensiveness. Yeah. Um, now, the other thing I, I'm not even mentioning because I don't do it, but you can make your own paper. You can do this on cloth uh, any size that, that you're willing to. And there's uh, someone sent me the other day the world's largest cyanotype. I don't know if you've yeah. seen this, but um, what you have to do, though, you, you have to figure out. It was about as big as this space here. They prepared the cloth. They had it protected so that nothing would happen. They set it out, and a bunch of people lay down on it. You know, oh, yeah. <laughs> for five minutes, ten minutes, whatever, and then they got off, and so, and then they put it in a bath, you know, in water. Uh, so it, it can be done. But part of what I like is, you know, I'm a writer. I do this. I do that. This is something that is fairly simple, and yeah. and I can do a couple in a day, or however you, you know you want to think about it, um, and according to the weather, and so on. I like the simplicity of it. It's possible, I could see going in the direction of doing more complicated things or doing, doing other takes on this. Um, I definitely can, but whether I'll get to it is another, another question. Don't, don't forget that you can change the colors. You can, now how would you, you do that? You can tone them. Tone them. Yes. Yeah. And it's, it's a pretty simple process. And uh. you can turn the blue to black, you mm. ask, or you could turn it to brown. Mm. And, um, you know. Well, I might have to take a little seminar with you. I think. Um, well, I was wondering what the paper was. The paper is paper I get from, um, this, this comes from Berkeley. It's from a, a place that sells cyanotype paper. And, and it's just called cyanotype paper. Hmm. Yeah, and so I just went with what I could get. Um, I, I'm sure there's other sources yeah. and other, other ways to do it, probably. I'm trying to picture yeah. you because, of course, with cyanotype paper, you have to have it in a in a bag. You that's do completely sunblocked. Right. 
try to imagine you climbing the tree. Oh, that I, bag well, I don't really have to climb, but I, I often have to reach up. I mean, I have occasionally gotten on a ladder, I, I will admit. Um, but it, uh, <laughs> it's a little touchy, you know. Um, you, you could do any of that. Yes, you, you have to keep it protected. I use uh, tubes, actually, but yeah, you could use some kind of envelope or, or some um, plastic, dark plastic or something. Um, yeah, you have to be there, you have to picture it, yeah. and then you have to be ready to go. And if you, especially if you want to do more than one, because then you have to roll it up, protect it, get the next one. You know, it's, it's I call it simple, but it's actually it's fairly complicated. And now I, I sort of have it down. Um, the, the, the little wrinkles, so to speak, to me were how to dry it. You know, these have this kind of ripple. That's about as flat as I can get it. But there's various ways to dry them so that they end up either being flat or, or less flat. And I, I've found a way to dry it that suits me. And, and basically, they, they dry overnight. It takes almost that long for them to kind of come up Is in color. Is it coated or pre-coated or do you coat it? Oh, it's pre-coated. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. So what I like, they're, they're very direct. You know, they're. You know, the paper comes from, from Berkeley, you know, I'm ready to go. I find something that I see, that I like, I, you know, scope it out, time of day, all that, go out, um, expose it, wash it, dry it, and that's all I can do. I mean, you could do other things, but I happen to like that simplicity of it. Mm -hmm. And I've found that in the various art forms that I am involved in, I do, I tend to go for simplicity and, and um, whatever that means, uh, I said to these guys the other day, I don't remember how I phrased it, but if there's a school of art that means doing things simply and by hand, that's my school <laughs> of art. <laughs> I've never had a dark room, you know, I just don't, I don't understand all that stuff. I, I like the, the plainer versions of this. Not to say that I don't like the results of all that, to show that I'm in, in England as we speak. Um, it's all photograms of different kinds and I'm the only one only one of two, I guess, of people using any kind of color and any kind of size. Mm -hmm. They're almost all, they look like little photographs, you know. Yeah. Um, and that's fine. Some of those are, are beautiful. It's just not what I'm doing at the moment. Yeah. So, anybody? Any other inquiring souls? Yeah. Yeah, I'm curious about how this relates to architectural drawings. Ah. Um, you know, I'm not sure I have a specific answer for that. Uh, in the early days, these were used to reproduce drawings, including architectural drawings, and also used to, um, to make photographic prints from glass plates because you could do it much more simply. So you would expose the paper through? Uh, with the You'd have a glass plate and you put the, the expo you know, an already exposed glass plate. It has a picture on it. And you'd make a, a cyanotype instead of making a, a silver print. Mm -hmm. um, now, since then, as Harry was pointing out to me earlier, um, the blueprint has changed, and they now use chemicals. And, and it's a more complicated process, even though they often come out blue. Um, but originally, it was used for reproduction of various kinds. Any kind of drawing that was on a translucent piece of paper or, or glass, you could do that. And people liked it because all they needed was water. So it was an inexpensive way. For example, I have some uh, old cyanotypes that I bought uh, from a, a um, actually they originated in, a, in an engineer's office in New York. They were pictures of Riverside Drive being built, things like that. They just they made these as records so that they would have a picture of what this bridge looked like when it was halfway done. They didn't want to bother with a photo lab. You know, they just took the picture and they made a cyanotype of it. So, so you have a drawing on a piece of translucent paper, put that on top of the photosensitive paper, <coughs> light sensitive paper. Yeah. And that way you can create several images. You can repeat the oh, right. Yes, it's repeatable. Mm -hmm. Right. Now, just um, so one thing that I did also with this process, which I, I didn't think to mention, I was, I was thinking about this also. Uh, I made, um, I was interested in classic things, which you'll see at the museum, um, statues, temples, this kind of thing, because they have deep shadows and they, they reproduce really nicely. I could not make cyanotypes out of them. It just didn't work. So um, 
I, I took a piece of big plastic and I, I just painted on the plastic and basically made a negative hmm. of these images that I was interested in, you know, my oh, version. clear plastic? Okay. And I used that like a negative. And so I have these, these I don't know, quite interesting prints of, of um, you know, Greek statues and, and temples and stuff, but they have a personal touch to them instead of being nature like these. Um, and that was really fun. You could do anything with that. And then, the, you know, there's all kinds of things. You, if I had put some objects in there, you know, in the tree, you would, you would get those. There's just endless amounts of, of things that you can do with it. But in terms of what you're saying, um, that's, the connection is that it was an easy way of reproducing things that were translucent and they would have to draw on translucent paper, um, and they did. Yeah, Harry. Well, it's, you have to think, what was it like the days before the Xerox machine? And here we are making, making these engineering drawings and architectural drawings. How do you reproduce them? You have to keep, make, you know, everyone needs a copy. So the cyanotype was a, was a huge breakthrough. Yeah, no, that. And if any of you remember the days when the blueprint was blue with little white lines on it. <laughs> right, so, so there it is. Um, yeah, it, it was a breakthrough, and it was used for a number of things. I think it was the blue, you know, people, there are limits to what you can do with something in, in just one color, and so that, that was the artistic limit, but practically speaking, yes, it was, it was a. It preceded the, the copy machine and, and all those, those types of things. Um, and goes right back to Fox Talbot, you know, one of the two inventors of photography. It was, it was uh, Anna Atkins was someone who was part of this British intelligentsia who they all knew each other. And, and so it first had a scientific use, but everything in photography was scientific to start with until it kind of got launched on a on an artistic, or they realized it had artistic potential. And some of those early cyanotypes and other prints by Fox Talbot are some of the most beautiful things you'll, you'll ever see. Uh, as someone interested in the history of photography, I have to say it's, it's hard for me to get interested in contemporary photography because the, the old, you know, the early photography is so stunning. Mm. And contemporary photography just has a whole different set of, of goals and, you know, interests to meet. Um, if you look at some of the 19th century landscape people, I mean, you will never see a finer negative than, than these people made, and, and beautiful prints usually. Um, but it's gone on to develop into, into something different, and uh, people don't try to simply repeat that. They have modern interests and contemporary interests. I, this is sort of a sideline, but I, I really started thinking about this, having studied photography for years now. The, the, the line sort of goes from um, photography, and there's a few predecessors, but not literally, but people discover photography. Um, they discover film, movies. They discover uh, television. They discover the computer. And, and all of those, that's kind of the family that these belong to. And they, they seem very different, but they all have to do with this reproducibility that was not known until, until 1839. And so it's definitely a, you know, an epoch-making kind of thing. And certain developments in photography are epoch-making, you know, the cyanotype or the glass plate. Um, uh, today, a lot of people have an interest in these older things. I, I went to a photo show in November, and some of the most beautiful things I saw were, were new daguerreotypes just incredible, you know, about this size. I mean, they were immense. Um, there's just certain beauty in these older processes that you can't get any other way. Uh, you, you could probably make something like it on a computer, but it, it isn't the same. Um, so they're devotees of these, these older processes. Yeah, good questions. I can tell we have some learned people here. Anybody else? Yes. <laughs> Hmm. Is there a way to fix the surface at all? Um, I was looking at the video of the largest at that point. Oh, yes, you probably said that, that to me. You probably said that to me. Of all the humans, it was 18 feet by six feet or something yeah. like that. And it was a really interesting video. So when I think of that being 
who knows where it would be displayed. Is there a way, because it's on fabric or whatever material, is there a way to fix the surface so it is um, completely light fast? Well, I, the yeah, no, I've been told that they are very, very stable. And yeah. even, even to the point, which I've never tried, that you can regenerate them if they, if they purportedly fade. You can purportedly bring them back, which I, I've never tried, but um, they're supposed to be among the most stable of photographs because when you wash them, you wash off all the, the photosensitive part of the emulsion and what, what you're left with are these, um, is the cyan, you know. Uh, so what those people would have done, as long as they washed it thoroughly, they'd be okay. But then you'd have to stretch it or, you know, you'd, you would have to have some way of presenting it, which I, I don't know. But they're supposed to be, um, they're supposed to be light, fast, or whatever mm -hmm. you, the term is, yeah. Um, I'm assuming so. I mean, I wouldn't, I wouldn't just put them in, you know, the sunniest room in the house, just on principle, but um, there's nothing to say you actually couldn't, so, especially with the special glasses. These are just regular glass, mm -hmm. but you can buy glass that will definitely slow that down considerably. Um, yeah, no, good, good question. Okay. Tom, how oh. did you get to this size? Have you worked smaller and bigger? I've certainly made smaller ones and bigger just by putting them together. But this is the size it comes in, you know, and I, I haven't been able to find bigger paper. And once I tried using it, I wasn't sure I wanted any bigger paper <laughs> because, uh, as I say about canvases with painting, you know, their other use is sales. Uh, you know, you get up there and you try to hold this thing in place, it's, it's kind of difficult. Uh, one thing I do is to tack it to some cardboard and that, that's one way of keeping it steady. But um, to try to deal with bigger pieces, I, I don't know if it's really feasible without more than one person. And of course you handle it and you start to get finger marks. There are all these, all these other aspects of it. Um, I'm wondering if you've moved up to this size to get that sense of the I moved, yes, I, yes, to this Maybe side. Maybe you didn't get it in your smaller um, Actually, there's two smaller ones here. They're, they're, they're very nice. They're just, yeah, they don't have the, I did, I did like the size, and you'll see with the, if you go to the museum, same with the drawings. I, I was looking for big drawings, big cyanotypes. There's something about that relationship. Uh, small things can be very beautiful. Here's one right here. Oh. And I'm not just talking about you. <laughs> that's, a, that's a small one. That's an indoor in the winter one. Um, it does have a little of that movement aura to it, but it's, um, yeah, that's a nice one. Um, I, I, you know, I just don't know from year to year what I'm going to do. I won't say day to day, but year to year anyway. Um, I could, I could be looking for something bigger. And what I probably have to do is get some really big paper and, and learn, learn how to do it, yeah. And the thing about that is you introduce a whole other set of things, you know, how even is it in all, you know, kind of technical issues that I don't have to deal with by buying already prepared paper. It could be an advantage, you know, you could get interesting things, texture of the paper and stuff. But for these, I was mostly looking for the trees to express themselves, you know. <laughs> I should probably not hold you too much longer. So, okay, if anybody has questions, oh, yeah. Um, can you talk about the relationship with the drawings and the cyanotypes, or whether mm. they don't have a relationship, or? Um, well, the first thing is, I think they really go well together, and even though I was doing them as separate bodies of work, I realized right away by hanging them up on my wall that they, they went very well together. And I think the reason is that these are full of kind of movement and energy and, and color, even though it's just one color. And these are very static and quiet and just per, pretty much the opposite. And, and the grayish drawing and the bluish um, cyanotype seem to go very well together. How they actually relate is more uh, through this, this idea of, of the lines that I was talking about. I, I'm interested in, in lines of different kinds and how they turn into forms of, of some kind. And um, so I, I would call them complementary. They're, they're not similar, 
by any means, I don't think. But, but they, the complementarity, I think, is in the chance, the chanciness of it. Um, you know, the, the little um, mm, sort of signs of motion and muscular pressure and so on that appear in these is kind of analogous to the differences of light and dark in these. I, I, can, see, I can see that people could call this looking like water and people could relate this to kind of undersea. Um, I can see that kind of a link, but physically the way they were made and so on, there isn't, I mean, they're, they're really two different things and I think they just happen to go together well. So that, that's the way I would think about that. Yes? Could you speak to us a little bit more about your um, drawings, those of, the, of you who might have been at the Brattleboro Museum uh, saw Tom's work there that uh, um, were quite different than these drawings and just wondering where they fall in terms of time frame or just is there an evolution of your drawing process? Yeah, yeah, drawing? yeah. Um, well, chronologically, um, cyanotypes, which started about five years ago, these minimalist drawings two or three years ago and the ones at the museum this year. And I wanted to do something bigger. Uh, I wanted to use lines, but I wanted it to be much more free, which those are. And so I picked subjects that were similar to this in the sense that they had a lot of contrast in them. And, and they just said, I am a temple, you know, or I am a column, or I am a statue. And my fun was to use various kinds of lines to fill in, including um, very broad lines, which was a challenge. And what that turned out to be, the answer turned out to be um, powdered graphite so that I could make, you know, it's paper, so it had to be dry. But I wanted to make a mark that was almost like watercolor or, or a big brush mark. And, and so I would, I found this graphite dust and I would make these things with cloth that you can, you can make a swath and that way I could, I could make uh, heavy shading on these big drawings and make much bigger drawings than I used to. But they're also full of detail and I, I do like detail and it's always nice to spend an afternoon kind of, you know, doing this stuff on, against a wall that was, um, you know, when you ended up, uh, there was a drawing. I mean, it was very exciting. Uh, so I started out with um, lantern slides because I like the art history view. The, you know, these were the view of, say, uh, the statue in the, the victory in, in the Louvre that everyone sees. You come up the stairs and here's this amazing statue. Um, so someone had taken a photograph of it in its best light and, you know, its prime whatever uh, days in the museum. And um, I didn't think I could do better than that. That wasn't what I was trying to do. I was trying to take that and turn it into something that was more personal and interpret it in a way. And so that's kind of where those drawings came from. There are about six of them. There are three at the museum. Uh, and they, they definitely, uh, they relate to this in, in their freedom, I guess. And they relate to these in the, that they're, they're all made of lines of one kind or another. Yeah. Glad you saw those. OK. Yes? Uh, I was wondering if there's any conscious interest in imagery of underwater. Uh, it's reminded so much of being on the retreat in very, very uh, cold weather where the uh, ice is very, very clear and you can see down to the bottom and you're seeing all these oh. different um, variations of tone and wow. light underneath the ice. Mm. Even the ripples, mm. which to me also, the ripples in the paper of the drawing yeah. seem to echo a lot of the lines in your, in your drawings yeah. too. And that's, I've been understanding that a lot lately, so that's very satisfying for me personally. Yeah, I would just call that resonance, you know, it, it resonates in different ways. You know, I, I once read this novel and um, there was a passage that I really liked in it and I ran into the author and I said, you know, this happens in this passage, isn't it amazing? And he said, he had no idea, you know, that he had done that. <laughs> um, it, was, it was my reaction to it, you know, and, and it resonated in some way with me and I think a lot of art that is partly why we like it. Um, it you, you're not even always conscious of it, but it, you know, it could remind you of ice or water. It's certainly not conscious. I mean, I, I didn't do that, but as soon as I started showing them to people, that was their reaction. And I think it's partly the color and it's partly the kind of murkiness of it and it looks as if things are floating around the way they do underwater. But I certainly wasn't trying to do that, if you mean 
That sounds like a beautiful image of the ice. Wow. So, okay. Oh, is that it? Okay. Thank you. Happy to uh, answer any questions.